بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Inshallah, continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Asirat al Nabawiyah, the prophetic biography. Today we'll be talking about um, the last of the um, events of the second year of Hijrah, the second year of the Prophet sallallahu residence in the city of Medina. And the event that we'll be discussing about particularly today, and I wanted some time uh, for us to be able to talk about this in some detail, because uh, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to further delve into the narrative here a little bit, is the marriage of the youngest of the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. So at the end of the second year of Hijrah, the Prophet of Allah wasallam basically married his daughter Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. The story of the marriage of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha is actually quite fascinating, quite interesting. Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu tells the story uh, in the first person, where he says that, I um, came home one time and the, one, of the, uh, one of the women in my household, in my family, she mentioned to me that the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hala alimta anna Fatima qad khutibat ila Rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She said that do you know that the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is receiving marriage proposals? Qultu la, I said I, I didn't know that. Qalat qad khutibat. People are starting to inquire about the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Fatima radiyallahu ta'ala anha. The age of Fatima radiyallahu ta'ala anha at this particular time is discussed. Some say she was 15, some say 16, some say 18. And basically the discrepancy is whether Fatima radiyallahu ta'ala anha was born a year or two before revelation or was she born a year or two after revelation. And so that difference of anywhere from about three to four years make causes the discrepancy of whether at this particular time she was 15 or whether she was 18 years old. But in either case, of course, she was of an appropriate age of marriage. And so some people had begun to inquire and marriage proposals or at least inquiries had started to come. So he says, I didn't know. So she says, yes, in fact, قَدْ خُطِبَتْ She is, people are inquiring about her. So she then says to me, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, فَمَا يَمْنَعُكَ أَن تَأْتِيَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فَيُزَوِّجَكَ that what prevents you from going to the Prophet ﷺ so that he can marry you to his daughter. فَقُلْتُ وَعِنْدِي شَيْءٌ أَتَزَوَّجُ بِهِ And so I responded by saying that, do I even have anything to get married with? فَقَالَتْ إِنَّكَ إِنْ جِئْتَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم زَوَّجَكَ She said, don't worry about that. If you go to the Prophet ﷺ, he'll figure something out for you. Alright, so she, and then he says, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا زَالَتْ تُرَجِّنِي حَتَّى دَخَلْتُ عَلَىٰ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. And he says that, I swear to God, Wallahi, I swear to Allah, she would not stop like encouraging me to go and talk to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم until I finally went to go see the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. This is where it gets very interesting. So he says that, now keep in mind who is Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu to the Prophet sallallahu He grew up in the home of the Prophet sallallahu He was raised by the Prophet sallallahu The Prophet sallallahu was, you know, a father type figure to him, like an uncle to him. Even though they were cousins, he was like an uncle to him. And he was his mentor, he is the messenger of Allah. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was very close to him and also very comfortable with him. In spite of that, obviously he says, فَلَمَّا أَنْ قَعَدْتُ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ أُفْحِمْتُ he says, but when I went and I sat down in front of him to talk about this matter, I became just completely silent. I could not get a word, a sound out of my mouth. All right? So a lot of times, you know, we talk about the awkwardness or the difficulty of the marriage process. Um, and a lot of times, you know, we'll say that, oh, it's not, it never, it's not that difficult and it's, there's nothing awkward about it. We've made it awkward. No, no, no. It's always been a little awkward. It's always been a little bit awkward, right? So whenever a young man approaches uh, a young woman's father, every single young man has always gotten a little bit scared, all right? So it's completely natural. This is Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He's a man who stood in the battlefield at the Battle of Badr just months ago and declared himself to be an alladhi sammat umuhu haydara. I'm the one whose mother called him a lion, named him a lion. So this is a warrior. 
right? And this is somebody who is very close to the Prophet ﷺ. But when it comes to marriage, he says, Ufhimtu. I could not get a sound out of my mouth. So the Prophet ﷺ, he says, فَوَاللَّهِ مَسْتَطَعْتُ أَنْ أَتَكَلَّمَ جَلَالَةً وَهِبَةً I was just so overwhelmed and intimidated that I couldn't speak a word. So the Prophet ﷺ is looking at Ali رضي الله تعالى عنه sitting in front of him, kind of wondering why did he just come and just sit down and then sit there silently just kind of staring, you know, blankly, you know, with this blank look on his face. What's going on here? So he says, مَا جَاءَ بِكَ أَلَكَ حَاجَةٌ What's, what, why have you come? Do you need something? Right? You kind of do that to somebody. Is everything okay? Do you need something? فَسَكَتُ He says, I, I was quiet. I couldn't say a word. So the Prophet ﷺ again says, مَا جَاءَ بِكَ أَلَكَ حَاجَةٌ Ali, what's going on with you? Do you need something? And he says, فَسَكَتُ I was silent. Not a word. And then a th- some narrations say a third time, he said, مَا جَاءَ بِكَ أَلَكَ حَاجَةٌ Do you need something? Why have you come here? Can I help you with something? And again, just silent. The Prophet ﷺ then understanding, he says, لَعَلَّكَ جِئْتَ تَخْتُبُ فَاطِمَةٌ You came to ask for Fatima's hand in marriage, didn't you? <laughs> he understood, right? The only thing that could stun you this way and that could put you into this you know, state of just silence and freeze you up like this has to be the only thing scarier than fighting in the battlefield and that is marriage. <laughs> right? That's the only thing. You're the guy who I can't get to sit down in the battlefield and you cannot utter a sound. You're frozen. Right? So it's got to be marriage. And it's got to be my daughter. Otherwise, you wouldn't be so afraid of talking to me. فَقُلْتُ نَعَمْ I finally said yes. That's it. One word, yes. So the Prophet ﷺ then said, you know, and this is kind of a lesson, opportunity for the fathers. Hey, listen. When you're talking to somebody about your baby girl, about your daughter, right? You give him, you give him the, the, you know, the third degree. Alright? You don't take it easy on him. And so he said, the Prophet ﷺ says, وَهَلْ عِنْدَكَ مِنْ شَيْءٍ do you have anything to offer her? Mahar, finances, what? What do you have? And he says, I said at that time, La wallahi ya Rasulullah. <laughs> I don't have anything, O Messenger of Allah. Wallahi, I don't have anything. <laughs> so you can imagine, this is not going as Ali radiallahu planned. And at that time, the Prophet ﷺ then, and you know, in another narration, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu actually says, فَتَذَكَّرْتُ فَتَذَكَّرْتُ صِلَتَهُ um, I remember the, you know, the صِلَةُ rahim of the Prophet ﷺ. Right? وَإِعَادَتَهُ And I remembered his good treatment. I recalled and remembered the fact that the Prophet ﷺ is very merciful to his family members, he's very kind, he's very generous. I had kept that in mind. So I said, لا يا رسول الله, wallahi, I don't have anything. So the Prophet ﷺ then said, ما فعل درعن سلحتك What happened to the armor that I had given to you? ما فعلت درعن سلحتك What happened to the armor that I had given you? Now, what armor is he talking about? Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that there was an armor the Prophet ﷺ had gifted to me, he had given to me. Some mentioned that it was from the Battle of Badr. And it was called the Hutamiyya. Hutamiyya. Hutamiyya basically, the reason why it was called that was Nisbatun um, ila batnim min Abdul Qais. Abdul Qais was a tribe, and there was a particular family in that tribe called Hutam, and they used to produce, they were known for making a particular type of armor. It was very wide, and it was very strong. And some, uh, some of the books of hadith also mentioned that Hutam, like, like the Qur'an says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَمَ الْحُطَمَ Right? It was also called Hutam, because it was known as الَّذِي يُكْسِرُ suyuf. It was called the sword breaker. It was called... The sword breaker, the sword shatter, right? It would shatter and break swords. So it was so heavy. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, وَإِنَّهُ لَعَرِيضٌ وَثَقِيلٌ It was heavy and it was wide. But the good thing about it was that wearing it, while it was heavy and it was wide, it was a lot to handle. If a strong enough of a man wore it, you could go into the middle of the enemy 
And every sword, anyone, the harder they tried to hit it, the more badly their sword would break on it. Right? So that armor. So he says, what happened to that armor? And he said, فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسُ عَلَيَّ بِعَدِهِ نَفْسُ عَلِي بِيَدِهِ إِنَّهَا لَحُطَمِيَّ مَا قِيمَتُهَا أَرْبَعَةَ دَرَاهِمْ in فَقُلْتُ عِنْدِي Some narrations he mentions that I did have that dira, that armor, but the reason why I didn't mention it was because number one, it's not the kind of thing you give in mahar. And number two was that I didn't think it was worth that much. Some narrations he actually says, I didn't think it was worth more than like a few darahim. Right? So it wasn't worth that much. So I said, I do have that, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said, قَدْ زَوَّجْتُ تُكَهَا فَبَعَثْ إِلَيْهَا بِهَا فَاسْتَحِلَّهَا بِهَا so he then, the Prophet ﷺ said, that will be the mahar, that is an appropriate mahar. And so now go ahead and start preparing. So in the course of preparing, there were a couple of things. Now the Prophet ﷺ told me to figure out two more things. Number one, a walima has to be done. Right? A feast, a walima will have to be arranged. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, I barely got some mahar together there. And so I didn't have enough to throw a lima. So it actually mentions, and this tells you about the sense of community they had, that some of the sahaba stepped forth and they basically pitched in and helped Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu throw his walima or, you know, offer a walima to the community. Um, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, or excuse me, Sa'ad bin Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, gave, you know, a lamb. Um, and then some other sahaba brought some other things as well. Along with that, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu wanted to go and make some money for the walima and also for the initial expenses, just you know, setting up a home and making the arrangements for having a family. So he says in one narration that the Prophet ﷺ advised me, he said, why don't you go and go get some idhkhir. Idhkhir was like a type of uh, grass or a type of leaf that they would have that they would use for different purposes like food and cooking and things like that. He said, why don't you go and get some idhkhir from the, from the woods a little bit outside of Medina and bring it and sell it. Um, so Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, I set out on this. So again, we learned quite a few lessons here. When the, when the Prophet sallallahu goes to Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha and tells her about that, you know, I have a marriage proposal for you that I like. And so I wanted to ask you about it as the compliance and the agreement of the bride is absolutely necessary. لا يحل لكم أن تريثوا النساء كرها Women cannot be given away forcefully. So she has to agree, she has to accept and give her consent. So the Prophet ﷺ tells her that I have chosen Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu for you. And Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha was very quiet. She didn't respond anything, probably out of you know shyness or modesty. And so the Prophet ﷺ mentions the qualities of uh, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu to her. And he specifically mentions that that Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu huwa uh, ahsanuhum, um, he specifically mentions about Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that, It's very beautiful praise of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, so I'd like to mention the exact wording. The Prophet ﷺ uh, specifically mentions to her that he is one of the earliest people to accept Islam. He is one of the most knowledgeable of my companions, and he is also one of the uh, best of my companions in terms of his character and his akhlaq. So those are the three things specifically the Prophet ﷺ mentions. That number one, he was very early to Islam. So he has seniority in Islam in spite of being so young. He has such seniority. The second thing that he mentions is that he has great knowledge. Like he's a very knowledgeable, very intelligent man. And then the third thing the Prophet ﷺ mentions about him specifically is that he is somebody of very, very good akhlaq. Yes, أَكْثَرُهُمْ عِلْمًا أَفْضَلُهُمْ حِلْمًا وَأَوَّلُهُمْ إِسْلَامًا he says that he is the most amongst my companions in terms of knowledge. He is the greatest or the most virtuous amongst them in patience. 
patience. And then the third thing is, وَأَوَّلُهُمْ إِسْلَامًا And he's one of the most senior in Islam. So these are some, you know, some very important points that we're picking up from the Prophet ﷺ in terms of what accounts for a good marriage proposal. Right? And kind of measure that against the types of things that, you know, we might look at today. He specifically mentions his knowledge, his intelligence. He mentions his hilm, forbearance, patience, akhlaq, character, demeanor. It's a very calm, very cool, very collected demeanor. And then the third thing is that he has seniority in terms of Islam. Very remarkable qualities. And Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. Um, and then the Prophet ﷺ goes on to say um, that um, he is also from amongst the most noble people in my eyes. Right? He's one of the people that I love and respect the most. So Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha also agrees to the marriage proposal. And so at this time, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, basically the, you know, the preparations are starting now. Right? The mahar has been designated, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu has accepted, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhu has accepted, the wali, the guardian, the father of the bride, none other than Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has also approved of this as well. Now the, some sahaba have made commitments to help Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu prepare a walima. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu has gone out, um, and he specifically says that I hired a man from Banu Qaynuqa. Banu Qaynuqa, which was a Jewish tribe, he says that I hired a man from there to help me um, go and bring these leaves of Izkhir and bring them back from there so that then I could sell them. Um, so Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu is out for work. And so the next thing I was going to mention actually here in terms of a lesson of this is, the Prophet ﷺ looks at the qualities of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, as I mentioned them. The fourth thing obviously is the sense of, you know, what, what is his financial circumstance? Right? What is his financial situation? Now that is important, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ asked. Right? So we always have two extremes in this conversation. One extreme is that it's only about the finances, and that's the only thing we're concerned about. And that's obviously problematic. Because you marry somebody based on their bank account, or their income, or their you know, income bracket, and then you don't have any care or concern for their deen, and their quality, and their character, then that's how you end up in trouble. Versus that, that at the same time should not create an opposite extreme where we say, no, money doesn't matter at all, the only thing that matters is deen. Right? Well, one's responsibility is a part of their deen. So yes, money in and of itself doesn't matter, but one's ability to handle responsibility and take on responsibility absolutely does matter and is a part of one's deen. And so that's why the Prophet of Allah Wasallam does pay attention to that. And he does inquire about that. But what the Prophet ﷺ realizes about Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, as I've mentioned numerous times now, here's somebody very intelligent, very pious, with unbelievable character and akhlaq, mashallah. He needs a little help in the area of finances. So now look what the Prophet ﷺ does. He doesn't disqualify Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he works with him on it. Gives him some advice. And so this teaches both, you know, families that might be looking for possible suitors or proposals for their daughters. But it also teaches young men as well that they should be open to this type of counsel and advice, right? That maybe you work with somebody on this. You get some advice in this regard. The ego a lot of times comes in the way as well, right? And so then, then they're not willing to listen to anyone or take any advice. So no, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu sits down and takes notes. He takes advice from the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, your dira over here. Yes, I have the dira. That will be your mahar. Okay, and you have this, this, and this ability. Why don't you go and start engaging in that type of business and make some money so that you can support your family. Okay, great, fantastic. Right, so so many profound lessons here. That we can see how the Prophet ﷺ functions as a father marrying his daughter. Right? So very, very important. Now Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu goes off to engage in his business. Now he says that while I was gone, he says, I owned two camels. I owned two she camels. The two she camels that I owned, one of them I had received um, from the spoils of war in the Battle of Badr. Min nasibi min al maghnami yawm badrin. It was from my portion of the spoils of war of Badr. The second one, أَعْطَانِي شَارِفًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْخُمْسِ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ 
The second she camel that I had was gifted to me by the Prophet ﷺ from, the, from his portion of the spoils of war on the day of Badr. From his portion of the spoils of war, the Prophet ﷺ gifted to me a she camel. So I had these two she camels. So he says that I had them tied up outside the house of an Ansari. I had them tied up outside the house of an Ansari. Now this, is, this story is a part of this incident and this timeline. But it's a very sensitive and delicate story. Um, so I'm going to handle it accordingly. So he says, I had these two she camels tied up outside the house of this Ansari Sahabi. You know, just looking after for me. And he says that I came back from, you know, my job gathering these, you know, idkhir to be able to sell them. Hatta jama'atu ma jama'atu, I had gotten what I had gotten. فَإِذَا أَنَا بِشَارِفَيْ قَدَ أُجِبَّتْ أَسْنِمَّتَهُمَا وَبُقِرَتْ خَوَاسِرُهُمَا وَأُخِذَ مِنْ أَكْبَادِهِمَا He says, I came to get my she camels because I was going to load the idkhir on there and maybe take it and, you know, go sell it in the marketplace. And I see that the she camels are dead. And they've been, basically, they've been uh, slaughtered, right? And then they've been, you know, cut open. And basically some meat, you know, like the liver and meat and stuff like that has been cut out from them. And he says, this is basically all that I own. I just got done with the most difficult conversation of my life. With not only the Messenger of God, وسلم, but with my father in law to be about my financial situation. And I'm doing something about it. I'm trying to make things happen here so I can get married. And I come back, and basically, my sole possession, all my wealth, is sitting here bleeding in the street. And he says that, فَلَمْ أَمْلِكَ عَلَىٰ فَلَمْ أَمْلِكَ He said, I started to, like, I started to cry. Like everything was gone. It says, حين رأيت المنظر, When I saw what had happened, فقلت من فعل هذا? I stood out there and I was like, who did this? So someone said, فَلَعَلَّهُ حَمْزَ بِنْ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِمِ وَهُوَ فِي الْبَيْتِ وَهُوَ فِي شَرْبٍ مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ Somebody said that, I think it was Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib. Your uncle Hamza did it. And he's inside this house and there's a group of you know, people there who are amongst the Ansar, who basically are kind of what we would call hanging out. There's a group of the Ansar that are there, and they're hanging out. And Hamza radiallahu ta'ala is with them, and he came out and he did this. Now the thing that it mentions is that they were, why would he do something like this? When they were all they were hanging out, they were also drinking wine. Now all of a sudden that perks everyone's ears, what are you talking about? Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Sayyidu shuhada, Ammu Rasulillah, Asadullahi wa asadu rasulihi. Right, this is the leader of all the martyrs, the uncle of the messenger, the lion of Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, may Allah be pleased with him. So, what do you mean drinking wine? What's going on over here? So keep in mind, this is before the prohibition of wine. This is before the prohibition of wine. In fact, this is even before the ayat came down that prohibited them from even praying with, you know, after being under the influence, the intoxication of wine. So this is way before all of that. Right? So this is still very early on. And so Hamza radiallahu ta'ala and some of the Ansar, they were consuming this wine. But keep in mind that we should not take this as some type of slight against the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Why? Because when the ayat of wine came down, contrary to maybe how we would react, when the ayah of the prohibition of intoxicants came down, the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, where they were standing, basically took, if they had anything, and they just immediately smashed the bottles and threw it away and tossed it away. They didn't ask or inquire, oh, um, I understand we can't drink this anymore, but can we sell it to somebody else? Can we give it away to some? No, no, they, they were not those types of people. When they were told, this is no longer permissible, they threw it away. Immediately. That's it, I'm done with it. I never even want to see it ever again. 
And it immediately, in that instance, in that moment, became the most detestable thing to them. So the Sahaba are people of extremely, very, very high caliber and quality. But this is before the prohibition of wine. Many of us who have maybe grown up as Muslims, been raised in Muslim families or in Muslim societies or cultures, the idea of alcohol might just be so shocking to us that we can't even fathom, but yeah, but they're the Sahaba, right? Keep in mind, this is before there was any prohibition of it at all. So it's a very different situation. So while they were drinking and Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu was under the influence of this wine, somebody said the poem, Alaya ya Hamzu li shurufin nawa. That somebody said, Oh Hamza, go and basically bring the meat of these fat she-camels. Right? Somebody kind of enticed him. So, Ali, uh, so Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, فَوَثَبَ Hamza إِلَى السَّيْفِ فَأَجَبَ أَسْنِيمَتَهُمَا وَبَقَرَ خَوَاسِرَهُمَا وَأَخْذَ مِنْ أَكْبَادِهِمَا Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu jumped up with his sword, went, sacrificed the camels, cut them open and pulled some meat, cut some meat and liver and things like that out, and brought it in and started roasting it and started consuming it right away. Right? Part of the party, the barbecue. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, فَانْتَلَقْتُ حَتَّى أَدْخُلَ عَلَى النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم وَعِنْدَهُ زَيْدِ بْنُ حَارِثَ I went immediately to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and Zayd bin Haritha, who was like family as well, right? So this is a family affair now, family issue. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, his uncle Hamza, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and Zayd bin Haritha is the adopted son of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Right? And who was Zayd bin Haritha was very close to Hamza radiallahu ta'ala. They were like brothers. Right? They were very, very close. So this is a family affair now. So he says that Zayd ibn Haritha is sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I walked in, فَعَرَفَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ الَّذِي لَقِيتُ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw the look on my face and he knew something was wrong. فَقَالَ Malak, He said, what's wrong? Ali, what's wrong? Like he recognized something's wrong. فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مَا رَأَيْتُكَ الْيَوْمِ You will not believe what happened today. The most unbelievable thing happened. عَدَى حَمْزَ عَلَى نَاقِتَيَّ فَأَجَبَّ أَسْنِمَتَهُمَا وَبَقَرَ خَوَاسِرَهُمَا وَهَاهُ أَذَا فِي بَيْتٍ مَعَ الشَّرْبٍ He says that Hamza went and he killed my camels and he did this and this and he's over there in that home along with some other people. فَدَعَى النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِرَدَائِي فَارْتَدَاهُ The Prophet ﷺ told Zayd, bring me my shawl. And he brought him the shawl and the Prophet ﷺ wrapped his shawl around him. ثُمَّ انطَلَقَ يَمْشِي And he went walking very quickly. And he says, وَتَبَعْتُهُ أَنَا وَزَيْدُ بْنُ حَارِثَ Me and Zayd ibn Haritha ran behind him. حَتَّى جَاءَ الْبَيْتَ الَّذِي فِيهِ حَمْزَ He reached the house where Hamza رضي الله عنه was. This is narration of Bukhari by the way. In case somebody is curious. This is narration of Bukhari. فَسَأْذَنَ عَلَيْهِ فَأَذِنَ لَهُ The Prophet ﷺ knocked. Took permission. Somebody said, come in. Who is it? Muhammad. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ went in. فَطَفِقَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ يَلُومُ حَمْزَ فِيمَا فَعَلْ The Prophet ﷺ walked in and he said, يَا حَمْزَ مَادَ فَعَلْتْ Right? He started to kind of say, Hamza, what did you do? Why would you do this? فَإِذَا حَمْزَ ثَمِلْ He says, Hamza رضي الله تعالى عنه was out of it. Right? He was not no longer like thinking clearly. He was quite intoxicated. Muhammadatun Ainahu. His eyes were red. Fanadara Hamza. So Hamza radiallahu ta'ala had this weird look on his face. His eyes looked like he was clearly intoxicated, being up all night. Fanadara Hamza ila Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He started staring at the Prophet. Very strangely. Thumma Sa'ad and Nadara. Then he started looking the Prophet up and down. Fanadara ila rukbate. He looked up at his knees. ثُمَّ سَعَدَ النَّظَرَ فَنَظَرَ إِلَىٰ وَجِهِ Then he kept on scanning the Prophet ﷺ until he looked up at his face. Kind of like sized him up. Whether he was trying to recognize him or what it was. ثُمَّ قَالَ حَمْزَ Then Hamza رضي الله تعالى عنه says, وَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا عَبِيدٌ لِيَبِي وَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا عَبِيدٌ لِيَبِي You guys are just my father's slaves. He was referring to Abdul Muttalib. So that's where, I mean, he was seeing that it's the grandson of my father, Zayd ibn Haritha, was also a slave in the family before. So he says, وَأَلْتُمْ إِلَّا عَبِيدٌ لِيَبِي All of you are just the slaves and sons of my father. Right? You're going to talk to me? But he's intoxicated, right? فَعَرَى النَّبِي صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ The Prophet immediately recognized that 
Hamza is very, very intoxicated right now. فَنَكَسَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ الْقَحْقَرَىٰ The Prophet ﷺ slowly backed out from there. Didn't say another word. Recognizing he's, in, he's intoxicated, now is not the time to speak to him. Slowly backed out from there. فَخَرَجَ وَخَرَجْنَ مَعَهُ We came out with him. The narration basically goes on that eventually um, the ayat of Khamar came down and the Prophet ﷺ handled the issue and Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu was made to apologize to Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and compensate him for what was lost. So now that the, basically the story moves forward, the Prophet ﷺ then performed the nikah, the marriage contract of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. And the Prophet ﷺ himself then took his daughter Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha along with her stuff to drop her off at the house of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he specifically gave her some gifts, which is oftentimes referred to as the tajhiz or jihaz or jahaz, right? That he basically sent some gifts with her uh, from a, as a father, you know, giving gift to her daughter. Jahaza Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم فاطمة في خميل وقربة ووسادة أدم حشوها إذخر. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم basically gave her um, a you know kind of like a blanket. And he gave her, you know, uh, like a nice blanket. He gave her a water skin, like a water sack, to be able to store water in. The Prophet ﷺ also gifted to her, um, like a bowl or some dish. The Prophet ﷺ also gave her a pillow that was made out of leather. A pillow that was made out of leather, and it was stuffed with, again, the leaves of idhkhir. Right, so it was considered a very nice type of pillow that he gave her this pillow. So he gave her some home supplies, right? Some furniture, what we would call, right? A blanket to sleep on, a pillow. Uh, gave her uh, the bowl, the dish, a water skin, a water sack, and this was the jihaz of the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. Keep in mind, this is Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ. This daughter of his is the one who the Prophet ﷺ would say, "Sayyidatu Nisa'i Ahlil Jannah." This is the leader of all the women of paradise. And this is the gift that she takes to her new home from her father. The simplicity. The simplicity of the Messenger wasallam. There's a, such a powerful story. I, when I was just reading through this, and I couldn't stop reading about Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. There's a powerful story I came across where the Prophet wasallam. one time he saw Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, and... She was wearing, um, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu had given her a gift. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu had given her a gift. And it was a gold necklace. Nothing very huge or elaborate. It was just like a little gold chain. And the Prophet ﷺ saw this in her neck. And so the Prophet ﷺ went and he kind of grabbed it and he said, What is this? What is this? And Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said that, Ahdani, uh, Ahdani ha Abu Hassan, referring to Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that my uh, husband Abu Hassan Ali, he gave this to me. Ahdaha ilayya Abu Hassan. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya Fatima, O Fatima, ayyasurruki an yaqul al nasu, do you want people to say, Fatima bin to Muhammad, wa that people refer to you as Fatima bintu Muhammad, wafi yadiki silsilatu min narin, and you have this chain made of fire, right? Very harsh. When we know it's permissible for women to wear. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, of course, wal ayyadu billah, God forbid, he had not earned it wrongly, it was not stolen or in, you know, uh, uh, impermissible property. This is one of the most honest men that ever walked the face of this earth. So it's permissible means, it's permissible for a woman to wear, and he's still referring to it as a chain made of fire. ثُمَّ خَرَجَ وَلَمْ يَقْعُدْ The Prophet said when he would go to visit Fatima radiallahu ta'ala, he would sit with her, sit next to her, he would hold her hand. He would hold her hand, he would talk to her. For hours sometimes. And he didn't sit down and he just left from the door. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha took off that necklace. She went and she found a slave 
And she used that necklace to purchase the freedom of that slave and freed the slave. She took that necklace, went and bought a man his freedom. Freed a slave. The Prophet ﷺ when he was told, did you hear what Fatima did? Ya Rasulullah. She did this, this, this. The Prophet ﷺ said, Alhamdulillahi ladhi najja Fatima min nar the ultimate praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who saved my daughter Fatima from the fire of hell. Subhanallah. That was the tarbiyah of the Prophet of the people in his household. Right? That was the simplicity and the sacrifice with which he lived and preached and worked and taught. And this is how he raised his children. It's permissible. But he said, not for the daughter of Muhammad wasallam. No, no, no. We live by a higher standard and a higher code. This is the Fatima. The Prophet ﷺ one time, he would say, يَا مَعْشَرَ قُرَيْشِ اِشْتَرُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ لَا أُغْنِي عَنْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ شَيْئًا He said, O oh people of Quraysh, basically, save your souls from the fire of hell. Save your souls from the fire of hell. I will not be able to help you in the least bit. He said, يَا بَنِي عَبْدِ مُنَافِ Owed the children of Abdu Munaf, right? Quraysh again, his family. La ugni ankum in Allahi shay'a. I cannot save you in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, work for your souls, work for your akhirah. Ya Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, la ugni ankum in Allahi shay'a. O Uncle Abbas, I cannot save you. Work to save yourself. Ya Safiya, Ammati Rasulillahi, Ammati Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O oh, Safiya, my aunt, Aunt Safiya, save yourself. I can't save you. Ya Fatima binti Muhammad. Ya Fatima binti Muhammad. Salini ma shi'ti min mali. O oh, Fatima, beloved daughter of Fatima, ask me whatever you want in this world. Take whatever, whatever I have, you can have all of it. You can ask me for anything that I have. I will give it to you. But he says, لا أغني عنك من الله شيئا. But I can't save you in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You gotta work to save yourself. Right? That's how the Prophet ﷺ had raised Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. This is why she was the person that she was. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa one time comes to visit Fatima. Or Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha one time goes to visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Fatima was very beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. Whenever I talked about this at Badr, whenever the Prophet ﷺ would travel, he would depart from the masjid with the group, with the sahaba. The last place he would go to before going to the masjid, he would go to the house of Fatima and check on her and let her know, I'll be back soon. And when he would arrive back in Medina, they would land the station. They would land back at the masjid and from the masjid, the first place, even though he lived next door to the masjid, he would first go to the house of Fatima and visit her and check on her and make sure she was doing okay. That's the type of love that he had for her. One time Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha comes to visit the Prophet sallallahu And she bakes some fresh bread. And she brings it to him and puts it down in front of him. The Prophet sallallahu says, What's the special occasion ya Fatima? And Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha says, No special occasion. I made fresh bread and I wanted to eat it with you. I, wa- I remembered you. So the Prophet sallallahu said, Bismillah took a bite of the bread. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah. And he said, Ya Fatima, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِهِ I swear by the one whose life, I swear by the one who's in whose hands is Muhammad's life. I swear by the one who holds my life in his hands. I swear by Allah. هَذَا أَوَّلُ طَعَامٍ أَكَلَهُ أَبُوكِ مُنْذُ ثَلَاثَةِ أَيَّامٍ This is the first morsel of food your father has eaten in three days. This was the Fatima who had learned from the Prophet ﷺ. So she gets married. And a very beautiful, remarkable story, but a very powerful, you know, lesson. When they get married, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha basically does all the work and tasks, everything that she needs to, running the entire household. And it's, you know, obviously it starts to take a toll on her children and everything. So she's struggling. So Ali radiallahu ta'ala anha, uh, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu tells his wife Fatima, why don't you go to the Prophet sallallahu and request him to provide for you a servant, a maid or somebody to help you around the house. 
Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha goes to pray Fajr. After Fajr, she goes to the house of the Prophet ﷺ. And she, the Prophet ﷺ is out running some errands, taking care of some things in the community. He's not there. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha tells the Prophet ﷺ when he comes home in the evening time, that Fatima had come looking for you. And so the Prophet ﷺ comes to the house of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. Ali and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhuma have laid down already. And they have that blanket on top of them. It said the blanket was so small that when they would wear it tulan, when they would wear it the long way, it wouldn't cover both of them completely. Like it wouldn't cover them completely. Their sides would be exposed. And when they would wear it wide, their feet would stick out and their head, it wouldn't cover their heads. Their feet and their heads would be outside of the blanket. So the Prophet ﷺ arrives, and he takes permission to enter. As he begins to enter, Ali radiallahu ta'ala who starts to get up, and the Prophet ﷺ says, Makanak, stay where you are. And he sits down between them. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala who says that I could feel, you know, the, 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 the leg of the Prophet ﷺ was very cold. It was nighttime, it was very cold. And I could feel the coldness of his leg against me. And the Prophet ﷺ says that you wanted help and assistance. Let me tell you something better. Khayram min al khadim. Let me tell you about something that's better than help and assistance. Recite whenever you lay down to go to bed. Recite, say Subhanallah thirty-three times. Sabbihillah thalathan wa thalathin. Wahmadillah thalathan wa thalathin. Say Alhamdulillah thirty-three times. وَكَبِّرِ اللَّهَ أَرْبَعَ وَثَلَاثِينَ And say Allahu Akbar 34 times. And this is better for you than any type of maid or servant or assistance. And the Prophet ﷺ left. But he still did not give a khadim. Because he says, no, not the family of the Messenger ﷺ. We don't have servants. We don't have maids. We do our work ourselves. But do this dhikr of Allah. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, I never stopped, I never quit doing that for the rest of my life. And I benefited from it. We all know, this is called the tasbih of Fatima. At tasbih Fatimi. The tasbih of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. So well known, so famous. But this tasbih was taught by a loving father to his beloved daughter. Right? Another very, you know, interesting incident from the marriage of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, is that towards the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, after Fatih Makkah, after the conquest of Makkah, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was considering uh, taking a second wife, another wife. And Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, when she found out about it, it's narrated in Bukhari and Muslim, that Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha was not happy. She wasn't comfortable. So she told the Prophet wasallam, I'm not comfortable with this. The Prophet wasallam spoke to Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he said, Fatima buda'atum minni. Fatima tu buda'atum minni. In another narration, the Prophet of Allah wasallam, he specifically says that, um, uses another word for buda'a, where the Prophet ﷺ says, Fatima tu, inna ma Fatima, shuj, shujnatun minni. Meaning, Fatima is a part of me. Fatima is a part of me. Yabsutu ni ma yabsutuha. Yubsitu ni ma yubsituha. Wa yukbidu ni ma yukbiduha. Yasurru ni ma yasurruha. Wa yubgidu ni ma yubgiduha. What makes her happy makes me happy. And what displeases her displeases me. What upsets her, upsets me. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu taking the hint, did not end up taking another wife during the lifetime of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. Specifically, some of the narrations mentioned that it was the daughter of Abu Jahl, and the Prophet ﷺ specifically commented on that as well. But the fact of the matter is that not only that particular woman, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, then never took any other second wife. Not just the daughter of Abu Jahl, never took any other wife. Because Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha wasn't comfortable with it. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, look, take care of Fatima. Take care of Fatima. 
And so Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he said, the Prophet said, لَسْتُ أُحَلِّلُ الْحَرَامِ وَلَا أُحَرِّمُ الْحَلَالِ I will not make the impermissible permissible and the permissible impermissible. I'm not saying it's haram on you to take another wife because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed you to. But I'm telling you, look out for my Fatima. Take care of my Fatima. Right? And so it's another very powerful story that shows you know, the relationship of Ali and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, and also the love that the Prophet sallallahu had for Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. Finally, um, Ali and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, they had, they had five children in total. They had five children in total. Hassan, Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, of course the famous Hassan Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. They had a third son by the name of Muhassin or Muhsin. Both versions are mentioned. Either it was Muhassin or Muhsin. Unfortunately, Muhassin or Muhsin he passed away as a child. So he didn't survive. And then they had two daughters, Ummu Kulthum and Zainab. So what's very beautiful about that is, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha named her two daughters after two of her sisters who had passed away. Two of her sisters who were deceased, who had passed away, in memory of them. And so these were the children of Ali and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, and even as an entire family, they were just a remarkable family. The famous story that pertains to the ayats of Surah Al-Insan, Surah Al-Dahar, إِنَّمَا نُطَعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا Right? That Ali and Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anhumah were fasting. And when they sat down to break their fast, yatiman, an orphan came saying, يَا آلَ بَيْتِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم O family of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم I'm a yatim, help me. And they gave their iftar, they gave their food to the yatim, and they drank water and slept hungry. The next day they were fasting, and they were uh, they were going to, or the next time they were fasting, they were going to sit down to break their fast. Asiran, yatiman, um, miskin. Excuse me, miskin. A miskin came, a poor person. And again, several family of the Prophet said, "I'm a miskin. Help me." And again, they gave their iftar to the miskin, and they drank water and went to sleep. Then again, the next time they're fasting, uh, a seer, a prisoner, comes and asks for food. They give the food and they sleep hungry themselves. When they go, uh, and then they don't tell anyone, they don't publicize, they don't advertise. Even when they, the people try to thank them that they're giving the food to, إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجِهِ لَا We fed you for the sake of Allah. لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جِزَانٌ وَلَا شَكُورًا that we fed you for the sake of Allah, we don't want any type of reward, we don't, meaning recompense from you, any compensation from you, we don't want any thanks from you. We did it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they go to the company of the Prophet wasallam, the Prophet wasallam congratulates him and tells him that these ayat were revealed because of the deed that you had done. This was the caliber and the quality of that family. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha was the one who would go to see the Prophet wasallam when he was close to his death, and would sit next to the Prophet ﷺ. She put the head of the Prophet ﷺ in her lap, cried, her tears falling on the face of the Prophet ﷺ. Wa karaba abata, wa karaba abata. Why does my father have to suffer like this? I mean, think about the plight of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. Her mother passed away when she was young. She lost three brothers in childhood. All three of her older sisters have passed away in front of her. The only person she has left is her father. She's crying. And the Prophet ﷺ tells her, لا أكرب على أبيك بعد اليوم Your father will not suffer after today. No more suffering for your father after today. And the Prophet ﷺ passed away the next day. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, when you read the narrations, she was never the same. The day the Prophet ﷺ passed away, she never recovered from that. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, her husband, one of the closest people to the Prophet ﷺ, he went for the janazah of the Messenger ﷺ, washed his body, took him, you know, put the Prophet ﷺ's body in the grave, buried the Messenger ﷺ. When he came back home, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, when she saw him, she yelled at him. 
She was so upset. Were you not ashamed pouring dirt on the body of the Messenger? How dare you put dirt on his body? Just, it was so tragic. Right? We're torn when we hear about it because he's our messenger. The Sahaba were stunned, speechless, cried like babies because they were his companions and friends. Imagine his only child who has a surviving child. Imagine what her plight must have been, what her situation must have been. She's never the same. And six months after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, in the beginning of the month of Ramadan, six months later, some narrations mentioned that it was the third day of Ramadan. Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, she called for some water. Water was brought to her. She was very ill, very sick. She was bedridden now for a few months. Called for some water. She washed herself, wore some clean clothes, prayed, made some dua, recited some Qur'an, laid down, closed her eyes and passed away. She was 28 or 29 years old at the time. 28 or 29 years old at the time. Six months after she lost her father. Radiallahu ta'ala anha. And at that time, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu left behind her young children, Hassan and Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu would go and stand at her grave and and he missed her so much that Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu stood at her grave and he would say, مَا لِي وَقَفْتُ عَلَى الْقُبُورِ مُسَلِّمًا قَبْرَ الْحَبِيبِ فَلَمْ يَرُدَّ جَوَابِي Why, what's wrong with me that I come here and stand on top of a grave saying salam, waiting for an answer? The grave of my beloved who does not respond to my salam. I come here day after day saying salam, waiting, longing for a response from my beloved. A habibun مَا لَكَ لَا تَرُدَّ جَوَابَنَا أَنَسِيتَ بَعْدِي خُلَّةَ الْأَحْبَابِ أَنَسِيتِ بَعْدَ بَعْدِي خُلَّةَ الْأَحْبَابِ That, O oh, beloved, مَا لَكِ لَا تَرُدِّي جَوَابَنَا Why is it, my beloved, why is it that you do not respond to me? You don't talk to me. Have you forgotten the good times that we enjoyed together? قَالَ الْحَبِيبُ And he says, that if my beloved could respond to me, she would say, قَالَ الْحَبِيبُ وَكَيْفَ لِي بِجَوَابِكُمْ وَأَنَا رَهِيبٌ جَنَادِلَ وَالتُرَابِ That how can I respond to you when I have gone and basically have succumbed to the dirt? أَكَلَتْ تُرَابُ مَحَاسِنِي فَنَسِيتُكُمْ وَحَجِبْتُ عَنْ أَهْلِي وَعَنْ أَتْرَابِ That the dirt has eaten away at my body and I have forgotten you. And I can no longer remember you. And basically, I have succumbed to the dirt. فَعَلَيْكُمْ مِنِّي السَّلَامِ تَقَطَّعَتْ مِنِّي وَمِنْكُمْ خُلَّةَ الْأَحْبَابِ So I give you salam. But realize that those times that we shared together are long gone. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu would stay, stand at the grave of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha and cry and recite these couplets. And mourn the loss of his beloved. This is the beautiful and remarkable story and marriage of Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, to Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them. And so their marriage was the, uh, the last concluding or uh, one of the last concluding events of the second year of Hijrah. And it's what I will mention here. Uh, at the conclusion of the discussion of the second year of Hijrah, insha'Allah, going forward from the next session, we will delve into the third year of Hijrah of the Prophet Wasallam's residence in the city of Medina. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.